Good evening. I'd like to call the regular monthly meeting of the Board of Education to order. Ms. Hibbs, would you call the roll, please? Uh, yes. Mr. Shear. Here. Mr. Polan. Mr. Parker. Mr. McCune. Here. Mrs. Martin. Here. Mrs. Felter. Here. Dr. Daniels. Here. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Welcome this evening. We have a, a busy agenda. Um, I think we're starting with our information presentation, the staff and parent survey results. Dr. Banikowski. Dr. Daniels, board members, thank you very much for the opportunity to share with you some of our survey results. And uh, it is a lot of data and information. These are my notebooks over here in case you ask me something. I need to rush over there and, and look at other pieces of data. Certainly surveys is one way that we, and it's a school district, take a look at perceptions out there, whether it be from staff or be from parents. But one of the things is certainly we know it's just one piece of the puzzle, gives us information. Uh, uh, regarding people's perception of different aspects of our uh, school district but it is again only one piece of the puzzle but an important piece uh, let's talk a little bit about the staff survey results we provided the staff survey uh, in uh, January not the best timing because of some snow days and some uh, changes in the schedule but we had 72 percent which is a very high percentage of our staff complete the survey and we're always glad to see that participation because otherwise if you have only a few percentage points it, it's not as good for de uh, decision making but of course as you see other survey results this is very high percentage uh, compared to what uh, a company might want and to take a look at uh, we have both certified licensed administrative staff that answer and respond to the survey as well as classified staff uh, as you can see the percentages there uh, on the screen uh, we certainly always want to encourage and and get our classified staff to increase their participation in the survey uh, but again that's pretty parallel to where it was uh, in the past uh, of course they're a little bit a smaller percentage of our entire uh, staff population uh, so that's a, a good percentage of respondents in both areas we take a look at a variety of areas from the Board of Education uh, all the way to overall feelings and job satisfaction so I'll give you just a little glimmer into that uh, I'm actually going to give you some trends data on the Board of Education questions, two questions uh, that went to staff because I thought you'd want to see the progression in these two particular areas. Uh, you can see uh, above 90 percent, so an increase in the, the focus on student learning and also an increase in providing appropriate uh, tools, resources for a quality education. And in these days of struggling budgets, I thought that was very positive for you as well. So you can see the, uh, the responses there. Let's take a look at the next area, and we've had an opportunity for our staff to give us some perception uh, related to the district as a whole. Uh, the first two questions I think are really good to take a look at. Both of those are new questions uh, that we have not had in the past. Uh, so you can see a very high percentage of a quality education uh, that our uh, staff is indicating. And of course, if our internal staff doesn't feel good about the education we're providing to our students, certainly that would be a concern to us. Uh, so very high at a 97 percent and you can see also a very high percentage for our superintendent wanted to take a, a more thorough look at himself and get some perceptions related to uh, the ability to communicate well within the district and uh, it being very approachable so you can see that high percentage there as well and the rest of the percentage again uh, for the next three questions are high uh, above that 85 percent mark that we like to have again we're a little bit low in uh, where we are low 
let's just uh, we are low in the last area in the district and the staff knowing about the district's finances and budget and how to access that information a bit lower of course for our classified versus our certified staff and again it was just asking are you do you know where to access that information certainly all available uh, very transparent uh, but we have some staff who are indicating that they don't know where to find that information so that's an area that we we'll continue to take a look at and we also want to take a look at where the staff has a perception regarding the personal work environment their specific work environment and you can see again the very top ones a very high percentage the safe and secure I think is a very important one in our day and age of not having sometimes a feeling of safety and security we have a very high percentage 93 percent approximately uh, feeling good about that and you can also see that we have a very high percentage of staff who feel that they're being able to use their talents and skills in their particular positions. An area, of course, that we're continuing to look at, uh, two areas that are almost 85%, uh, looking at our appropriate tools and equipment and is receiving recognition for their work, and that's an area that we have uh, improved in over time, but it's quite not quite where we would like it to be. Uh, and probably an area that is low that we're considering what, what can we do about that, and probably has uh, been ch more challenged with our budget constraints is the workload uh, being appropriately distributed. So that's another area that we're looking at as well. And, oh my gosh, we should just feel very good as an organization, uh, the overall satisfaction with a job. And you can see that is 91.4%. Very, very similar to last year. It was 91.6%. So virtually the same response, very high response of work satisfaction in our school district and you can also see a very high response that I'm proud to work for this school district and that is also something that we should celebrate and again that 96 percent is the exact same about, uh, percentage of last year so again a very high percentage as we look at our staff survey we've had the opportunity also to look at comments uh, we're always very confidential about the comments because they do sometimes mention people that, by name or program programs or uh, schools by name so we always take a very careful look at those but all of these comments have been analyzed by district staff so in our senior leadership group we've had an opportunity to take a look at every one of those particular areas for example Mr. Payne looked at all the uh, compliments concerns and questions related to human resources and we have an action plan for each one of those areas both the highlights and is there something we need to do differently in that particular area so we've really analyzed that particular uh, ones as, as well. In addition to what we look at from a district perspective, each building and school receives their response results as well. So they can analyze for their particular building or school what were their responses like and also an opportunity for them to look at the comments as well as the results. And that's a very important part of our school improvement process, if you will, as we attempt to always be better. Certainly we are a people organization organization and looking at our quality people and making sure that they have an opportunity to provide us input as an organization is very important. We are very much communicating these results uh, and we have an opportunity on the ozone we'll give a summary of these results and uh, for some reason it's not on the slide here but we'll have an opportunity for staff to get results from this and uh, we're doing it in a graphic format this year and it's very easy to read and get information in just just one quick uh, look and we're going to be doing the same for parents. Let me talk a little bit about the parent survey results. Uh, we uh, had an opportunity in February Again, not the most consistent month for weather and making sure we were communicating with people. I think they were more interested on whether we were having a snow day or not. But we had an opportunity to send this out to all our parents in our school district. The email comes through the principal and they use a variety of formats uh, to share that. As well as a parent-teacher conference, we used actually a QR code this year uh, so that people who were uh, waiting maybe for a parent-teacher conference would have an opportunity to click on that and finish the survey 
right there. So you can see all the questions that we ask, everything from the national questions that we have typically asked, as well as overall satisfaction. About 15% of our parents responded. We would love to have it to be higher, but uh, sometimes you can't uh, get people to answer a survey, and uh, even though we have shortened it greatly, um, but again, a, a nice response to give us some information related to our parents. Let's take a look first at the national questions, uh, an opportunity for us to take a look at that area. You can see that our parents feel very strong about the Olathe School District, the administrators, the Board of Education, the teachers, and those are all very high in the 90%. The first score, though, you might see is the 73%. You think, oh my gosh, that's not very good. But really, take a look at what they're uh, comparing. They're talking about the public schools nationally. And really, that's very high compared to uh, the perception across the nation. Only 18% feel that the nation's school are doing a good job, A or B job. So actually we have a better perception of our schools in the nation than many other people do obviously responding to the survey. But again, when they're thinking about the Olathe public schools, look at all those scores above 90%. Uh, gosh, almost all of them, even almost close to ni above 95%. So that's a very good response rate. Again, the Board of Education, we asked three questions of our parents to respond to related to the Board of Education. And you can again see all three of those areas actually increased and that's a very good response rate as well as look at the above 90 percent uh, for the perception of the parents who completed the survey related to the board of education in the next area we actually also ask do you does your child ride the bus and 611 people responded yes and then answered these questions about the bus company as you can see some areas are strong such as the first one emphasizes safety but a few areas are certainly ones that we want to uh, have increased and uh, we are sharing that we shared that results of course with Dr. Dugan and uh, Mr. Green and they're going to share it with the bus company and make sure that we're always focusing on improvement in that area again I should also have mentioned the one the 92 percent the bus driver treats patrons in a professional manner so again that was also very positive so again some positive areas a couple areas that uh, probably need some improvement and that we uh, look at in that particular area. Another thing that we ask parents is to look at the district as a whole. And an opportunity, as you can see, five of the responses are actually above a 90%. 10 of the 12 areas showed an increase. And that's a very uh, positive result that you want to have. There's six areas I would highlight as a positive. Uh, people feel informed. Uh, Maggie Cole takes full credit for that. Um, that was a slight joke. Uh, they feel like they're getting a value for their tax dollar. Uh, financially, a big increase uh, knowing how we're doing as a district financially. Uh, they feel that we respond courteously and that we have great leadership and that we prepare our students for high High school or life after high school. Again, some very positive results in that particular area. As we look at the next area, we have an opportunity as well to look at each level, elementary, middle school, and high school. Again, eight out of the 12 areas across all three levels are above 90%. So that's a very positive indicator as well. Only one is below 85%, and that happens to be in the area of healthy choices for my student in related to meals. But to have that high of a score related to school lunches is actually, in my opinion, somewhat of a celebration, even though we continue to look at that particular area. Uh, we also asked parents. Uh, we had 338 of parents indicate that they have a student that is in a 21st century program. And again, all of these areas are above 90 percent and a great increase in many of the areas so we have to feel very positive that our 21st century programs are meeting the needs of our students in addition we have comments in this particular area you can see 600 comments some of those comments are multiple from the same person uh, but it gives us an opportunity to take a look we have not yet analyzed those this is data hot off the press uh, but the uh, senior leadership will be doing that again as well as each building, a school, will have an opportunity to look at their results, 
and their comments and analyze that. I want to end the parent survey area with talking about the fact that 94% of our parents are satisfied with the Olathe Public Schools, and that's a great percentage for us to celebrate. Even though we're constantly wanting to have even better scores, we have to feel very good about these positive results. And in conclusion, I would add that uh, we're very much spending time in making sure we communicate the results of these surveys and also using the data to make decisions. So that gives you just a glimpse of the large data that we look at related to survey results. Stand for any questions. Thank you, Dr. Banikowski. Questions or comments? I have, I have one comment, suggestion maybe to make about, um, there's kind of a theme about the public and staff understanding our financial situation. And I don't know if any of you have heard comments um, in committee hearings recently from organizations that, that say apparently there's a state statute that our, a, a button for our financial information has to be on the front page of our website. And I, th I went and looked at ours, and I think you have to click on business and then financial report. Maybe just moving that button to the front page would help uh, people who just, they're curious and they just go look, to just glimpse up that and, and take a peek and then help that score a little bit. Well, I know Mr. Hutchison, as the leader in this particular area, is helping to make sure that we're taking a look at all aspects that we could uh, take a look at improvement and be some, certainly something we'll consider. Yeah. That'd be great. I was open to suggestions. Well, a lot of work went into this, and thanks to the staff and the parents who filled out the surveys because it gives very vital feedback, doesn't it? Yes. Um, very. And to me, the one thing that stuck out as as kind of generally needing the attention was our transportation, and so I'm hearing that you, that that's going to yes, John Hutchison and Aaron uh, actually, Dugan. and and Dr. Dugan and Mr. Uh, Green you. is also as they work with transportation, making sure they share those results, which we did of course last year. Make sure we share those with the bus company and use it in a conversation for improvement. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you for all your hard work. Well, thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. All right. Let's see how quickly we can move some, move through some of these items. All right. So we will go to our action consent agenda items 5.01 through 5.07. Comments or questions? If not, I would entertain a motion. I'll make a motion to approve 5.01 through 5.07 to approve the consent agenda items as presented. Second. I have a motion by Mr. McCune and a second by Mr. Shear to approve the consent agenda items as listed. Ms. Hidden? Mr. Shear. Yes. Mr. Parker. Yes. Mr. McCune? Yes. Mrs. Martin? Yes. Mrs. Felter? Yes. Dr. Daniels? Yes. All right. Under action bids, contracts, and agreements, there are about 4,000 of them. <laughs> and so what I thought we would do first is see if there are any we'd like to pull and discuss separately, and then we might try to do the rest in a lump sum. Would that, would that be agreeable to board members? There's another one. Be agreeable to another me. Another bid coming in. <laughs> <laughs> or it could be. All right. So, items to be pulled. Madam Can President, I'd, speak first? I'd like to pull a 6.28. Okay. And we'll have some comments about 6.28 in a minute. Oh, come on, there's got to be another one. <laughs> we can't be done by 645. Uh, 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 Madam President, I think uh, 6.30 would uh, deserve some uh, discussion, uh, so let's, let's pull it. Okay. <laughs> Would we be satisfied then in lumping 6.01 through 6.27 together? Yeah. Excellent. Can you remember all that? 
You want okay. to do um, 2-9? Uh, Madam President, that too? we 2-9. Two, 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 nine, two, two, nine. Yep. Sure. Mm -hmm. I was just trying to make it easy for her to write. Okay. All right. I would entertain a motion. I would move for approval for um, action items 6.01 through 6.27 and to include 6.29. Second. I have a motion by Mr. Parker and a second by Mr. McCune to improve action item 6.01 through 6.27 and to include 6.29. Ms. Hip? Mr. Parker? Yes. Mr. McCune? Yes. Mrs. Martin? Yes. Mrs. Felter? Yes. Dr. Daniels? Yes. Mr. Shear? Yes. All right. Uh, Madam President, before we take action or discuss 6.28, I need to recuse myself for potential conflict of interest. You are excused. Dr. Berry, do you have some comments that you would like to make on 6.28? Sure. And the first comment is that we are 3,970 items short of 4,000 uh, tonight. But, uh, it details, is a, details. <laughs> it is quite a number, and obviously uh, it is because we are uh, deep into so many projects. And so Greg and the business staff and the service center staff, uh, uh, John and his staff, everybody is, uh, is working as quickly as we can. And so just a lot of items to bring before you tonight, so we appreciate that. We are taking 6.28 and changing the recommendation by staff tonight. Uh, that recommendation would be to not accept the alternate bid after having a chance to vet that out a little bit more, but to accept the low bid on the equipment that was specified. So that would be uh, the item from Hockenberg's at 413,197. This is for food production equipment uh, next door. So you have a new recommendation sheet coming out to you. So now on 6.28, the recommendation would be for those three companies uh, as presented. And still under the estimate. Still under the estimate, correct? Yes, it is. Any questions or comments by board members? Right. And Mr. Hutchison, on this one, it does say that the funding source is still the 2007 bond. Can you speak to that briefly? Uh, yes, sir. As, as you recall, um, as we completed projects on the 2007 bond, because we uh, did so well bidding along the way in kind of a down economy, we had additional funds after the projects were completed. Board in their purview was able to reallocate to some classroom with outdoor projects and food production um, uh, uh, renovation. And therefore, uh, the equipment that's going in that renovation is charged 2007 also. Okay. Do you happen to have a balance of what's left in 2007 bond that we'll be able to We are use? currently looking at that right now and we could uh, report that out uh, uh, shortly. Okay. Millbrook is obviously the last big project out of there and so we are, uh, you know, finishing that up and uh, but we'll have that total for you. If there are no other questions, then I would entertain a motion. So is the, is the bid totaling still the 420, or do we have to do the math in our head to come up read with this what one. bid is? You would read this sign here. Is it the total? Okay. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, with that, I would I would make a motion to accept the bids totaling $465,313 for food service equipment as listed in the following bid summary. Do we need to list each one of these out, or do we just accept it the way it is? I think it's fine to just okay. Second. I have a motion by Mr. Shear and a second by Ms. Felter to accept the substitute recommendation for the food service equipment bids. Ms. Hip? Mrs. Martin? Yes. Mrs. Felter? Yes. Dr. Daniels? Yes. Mr. Shear? Yes. Mr. McCune? Yes. All right. Thank you. We only talked about you a little bit. Right. Mm -hmm. 
Let's talk about 6.30, the security cameras for our elementary schools. Mr. Parker, did you have some questions? No, I, no, I, I didn't have any questions. I was uh, like the president, the uh, approach that we're taking, but I think it would be good for the public to kind of understand what we're doing at our schools in regards to monitoring where the cameras are going to be at, <clears throat> what's their purpose, uh, how are they going to enhance security at the schools, um, just important information that our public would need to know. Sure, and I may uh, entertain some help here from Dr. Dugan and John Hutchison, who are also on this committee. They can kind of talk to how we kind of landed on the uh, elementary sites and what cameras we're going to place in there, the security needs there. So, Aaron, do you want to address some of that? You bet. I'm happy to share general philosophy about cameras and security. When we did, I won't tell you where they are placed or any of those things because that keeps it secure for us. And um, Part of the bond and safety and security initiatives and recommendations from our security consultant was about having better eyes on those coming in our front doors. So one of the enhancements is that front camera buzzer system, clear picture, can read an ID very clearly, bigger monitor for the staff inside, uh, so that particular system. Then we're also looking at another camera somewhere inside for a second look at anyone coming in. Um, cameras are a deterrent in and of themselves. Um, so they send a positive message. Um, we're also looking at having some outside cameras. Some of that is for vandalism or suspicious activity when it shouldn't be happening. Some of that natural surveillance and our security consultants been very um, clear with us that that natural surveillance, keeping an eye on the day to day stuff, you really will pick up on unique circumstances to be aware of. So um, we f we're excited. We're most excited about the new camera front door buzzer systems, the clarity, the new technology. Our staff have been very receptive to the ones we've piloted and, and feel like ease, ease of use um, and just clarity of the picture is going to help tremendously. Uh, so uh, th these will be in every elementary school? They will be. So as we're doing those pinch points, we'll be adding those, and they'll be going back and then retrofitting those buildings. So we'll be replacing those front door elementary camera systems um, with the new ones. We'll also be looking at adding them at some level at all our middle schools and high schools, also adding and enhancing their existing camera systems. Okay. So that the, the community can feel comfortable in that. Do we already have them at the high schools and the middle schools? There, are, no. High schools. High schools, high schools have only. some uh, uh, internal and external cameras, and we'll be adding and supplementing to those. But also that front door camera system will be a new addition and a new practice and protocol at our middle and high schools. So we already have them at the, uh, middle schools. We're going to be putting them at the middle. They'll schools. be new front door <clears throat> buzzer camera. That that kind of visitor mm -hmm. protocol will be new as we add these devices at middle. So um, I, th I think the uh, one of the protocols that we have now in the school district is before someone's a allowed entrance in the school building, they have to show identification. Correct. Do we train front office staff in that? We do. Do we train them in the middle of the year so they make sure that they just don't say, oh, yeah, I know that person and they look really familiar and I'll let them in? We you go bet. back and retrain them and say everybody shows their identification, even if it's Mr. Parker comes to school, he has to show his identification in order to get in, even if he's your best buddy. You bet. And we rely heavily on our building leaders. I mean, that's a leadership at the building level. Level to maintain that expectation um, and do reminders and refreshers and we re um, and we remind staff of that from from time to time we do we they do card full we, year we do they card me every time I come through so it uh, <laughs> I, I, know right, I had just that. I had someone mention to me that maybe that wasn't done across the board in all cases and so we just need to re reiterate to our staff that we don't take anything for granted everybody has to show their identification before they're admitted even if they come every day it is certainly an expectation that everyone will show ID whether they're an and employee or we just want to reinforce that with the staff indeed with our with our front office people all right it's because it's easy one of those things you get the lack of days ago oh yeah I know that person I know that person and it's part of that natural surveillance and consistency with practices and that's part of this message that it may be inconvenient but it's safe okay 
And Mr. Parker, I want to make sure it's clear that what we're proposing tonight is just for the elementary schools. We will come back to you with another proposal for the, the middle schools because those look totally different. They're interior and exterior cameras. So we will come back after we get the elementary schools done with middle schools and then go back with the refresh of the high school. So I want to make sure that that was clear. So what's our timeline for having these completed? These, in, there's a requirement for the vendor to have all these done by May of 2015. So they have a year. That's a, that's a year away. So that's the best we can do no. in regards to time. We, we really think that we can push and have these done maybe even by December, but we've got a lot of other construction going along with this. So the summer is going to look a little, little different in some places, but um, we've also got all the cabling to pull. So uh, 35 sites is a lot to get to, but we're going to step it out just as quickly as we can. Okay, so May 15 is is the worst case scenario. And, the worst and, case scenario. Okay, so we're going to uh, over deliver and under over under promise and over deliver absolutely all right you know. yeah i think it'd be important to, for the community to know that and and how, how have we decided what schools are going to be done when it just um, it's just kind of a random thing or no actually a, there's a method to our madness okay uh, we are working with greg thomason and with all the construction projects that are going on we've got three schools that we know we've already had the pilots in we've already got the cable run the the uh the mounts are already there we'll go back in and do those immediately as well as Millbrook. Then we've got some schools that there aren't any much construction going on this summer. The new schools like Forest View, uh, uh, Madison Place, so we know we can get those uh, knocked out right away. And a school that's not getting epoxy floors because those uh, sometimes restrict where you can go in the building. So we really do kind of have a method to our madness. We've mapped it out, but we're continuing to work with construction just to maneuver through all, everything that's going on this summer. So we right. have a method. Yeah, I, and I just want the community to understand that we have a sense of urgency to this. We appreciate the bond, and this is really important to us and from our safety and security standpoint. So we are moving this as rapidly forward as Absolutely. we can do it. Okay. <clears throat> And is the monitoring hub in the front office? Can you talk a little bit about that? It comes through on a computer screen, just like you're looking at there at your desk. Uh, we will place it, too, in the front office. Um, availability for it at the principal's desk if she wants to view it. And in some cases, a fourth place, like, for example, at Indian Creek where we did a, a pilot there, the nurse wanted to be able to monitor and unlock the door because sometimes the secretary was busy on another call and couldn't get there. So at least three, possibly four, will also be able to monitor it remotely. Uh, Mr. Fields could uh, monitor it from here, or if Erin Dugan really didn't have anything else to do today and she really wanted to sit and watch all those cameras at the elementaries, so there's remote access as well as we have we will have the ability for the police department to have remote access if needed i love that um and then there's audio obviously so you yes. can say show your id and what sort of warranty do these cameras this three is years. Have three years mm -hmm. three is years full standard? replacement uh actually a lot of them are only one year okay. So three years is very good. It sounded good to me. Do they record? They do. We will. the The proposal is to record up to a minimum of 21 days. Mm -hmm. So after 21 days, it'll start writing over. You usually get more than that, depending on the compression rate of the video that you set it up in the system. You you could get 30, uh, but we feel 21. Um, we kind of went with what would be the pretty much the maximum time except during the summer that staff would be out of the building that we need that video recorded so we took a look at winter break you usually have a full two weeks weekends on each end and maybe a day or two on either side sometimes so we went with 21 days and and that's probably the typical in a school district is 14 but we pushed it out to 21. great thank you so much uh, Doc, Dr. Dugan, this is a second question, not related to cameras. We talked about it before as we do these remodels in the schools. The, from going through the office, the pinch point into the school, have we decided we're going to lock that door? Is that door into the school going to be unlocked? We're going to come to you and possibly in an executive session with a full report with some recommendations on that at all three levels about how many Executive sets session because of we doors really don't want the public to know. It's okay, a security so. plan and we'd like to keep it secure and, okay. and get your input though. So we have intentions to bring 
having a full report that has that and some other large scale security district philosophy pieces that's in a draft format now that we're reviewing them we'll bring to you here soon. Dr. D Dr. Berry, would that be in violation of COMA? No. Oh. So that's something that we'd be able to do in executive that's session. Right. And I understand we want to be sensitive. The public wants to know that we're, we're doing a, our due diligence on this and getting it done and getting it done correctly. But I understand that there would be some some necessity for us to keep some things confidential um, in regards to security. That's correct. OK. And we're allowed to do that. That's correct. Thank you. Actually, the recommendation that we got from the state and the general attorney's office was okay. to do that in executive right. session. Very good. We asked the same thing. <laughs> so w when can we expect that report then? When, when would that be? I, I think we could probably do it in May if, if you would want us to. No, we could do it in June if Thank you want you. us to. Thank <laughs> you. I won't be here in May. Okay. Sorry. I was so, going to say uh, June. I don't know why. I won't be able to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I missed that. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll, we'll have we'll have that report before we while we're before we start significant get to the point in construction where we can make the modify it or, or agree with the plan accordingly. You bet. And the plan now is we're doing some of this and, and Mr. Hutchinson can jump in, but we're going to put the mechanisms in place, the practice, the protocol, how they're used, when. That's the discussion we're going to have with you guys separately. But as they do construction and put in these pieces, the mechanisms will be there when we make them live or not and how will be our conversation All right. so we'll have the flexibility to do any combination that we would want to All right. one thing that stood out is that our staff is pulling all the wires we will. So we're wiring all those buildings that's huge well it is huge and it was also it was also in favor of, that was a favorable thing to the vendors because with 35 different buildings built over how many years uh, that could be a large variable from building to building so for us doing that uh, ourselves saves the district a tremendous amount of money and it also saves a tremendous amount of time in getting this done good appreciate it the reason why you're so recognizable in all the buildings it's that poster that's right there on the wall <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to make the motion, Mr. Parker, after all those questions? Uh, sure. Thank you. Uh, so I would uh, move to award contract to American Digital Security to complete all camera installations at all 35 elementary schools by May of 2015 <laughs> and the Technology Support Center for a price not to exceed 860000 Second. I noticed that you added a little wording there. <laughs> I have a motion by Mr. Parker and a second by Ms. Felter to award the contract for the security cameras for the elementary schools. Ms. Hibbs? Mrs. Felter? Yes. Dr. Daniels? Yes. Mr. Shear? Yes. Mr. Parker? Yes. Mr. McCune? Yes. Mrs. Martin? Yes. All right. I think we could get maybe at least a couple action items done here. Let's try 7.01, approval of e-payables as an allowed prepayment. Questions, comments? I move to authorize advance payments for e-payable invoices for 2013-2014. Second. I have a motion by Ms. Felter and a second by Mr. Parker for approval of the e-payables as an allowed prepayment. Ms. Hibb? Mr. Parker? Yes. Mr. McCune? Yes. Mrs. Martin? Yes. Mrs. Felter? Yes. Dr. Daniels? Yes. Mrs. Shear? Yes. Our Mr. Shear, excuse me. Is my wife here? <laughs> <laughs> do you all feel like we have time to do 7.02, or should I go ahead and come back to that one? Do it. Do it? All right. Then 7.02 is the board resolution regarding the timing of school board elections in Kansas. Well, Mr. President, I'd, I'd like to just take a, just a, a couple of minutes to talk to this first off. I think that'd be terrific. Wonderful. Um, you know, these, this is one of the things that, that we wanted to bring to the board and, and then bring it to the vote and, and make sure that this is something that we all agree upon. You know, some of the notes that I just wanted to bring up about this is that there's, there's a, many reasons, um, you know, why we wanted to, to uh, at least present this resolution and, you know, some just to bring it out to the public's notice and what's going on. A couple of different things that you need to think about is that if, if, if in fact, um, 
If in fact the uh, the vote is moved from April to November, there's going to be a lot of different things that'll disrupt as far as what happens with the board already. You know, a, a couple of different things is that the new board members would be seated in January. Uh, which is in the middle of the planning year, which is in the middle of the academic year, which is in the middle, middle of the fiscal year. Um, in addition to that, it also could possibly create an eight month lame duck status for board members who are not returning. Um, it also creates confusion for staff and community about who is authorized to make decisions and how, how the permanent the decisions may be going forward from that. Um, also, with this, if it does go this way, it would, um, it, the potential of replacing nonpartisan board members using a partisan model. Uh, the pre precincts today do not align with the board districts. 30% of the elect electorate are unaffiliated with and thus have no voice in the replacements. And this is also introducing partisan politics into a nonpartisan election process, which creates division where uh, currently none of that uh, currently exists. And so, if it's appropriate, I would, I would like to be able to read the resolution just so the public again has opportunity. We got 20 minutes, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't take that long to read it out. Before before we read it, I think it's appropriate to also mention that the reason we're doing this now, this reflects a position that, that we took last fall when we came up with our legislative priorities and it is a measure that has passed through um, committees in both the House and the Senate in Kansas to change it. I know that, uh, that Ms. Felter and myself have spent a lot of time talking to our representatives about the potential harm this change could do to the school district. Um, however, the bills both seem to have quite a bit of momentum still. So I hope that as Mr. Shearer reads this, you guys pay attention and if you feel inclined share your thoughts because they they've heard from us and some of the feedback we're getting is that as board members we're too close to this to be objective so i hope that all of you will really take some thought as to what's being read here tonight and come up with your position on it and if you feel inclined share that with your representative because i think i think all all of us tonight agree that uh, if this change were to come through it could it could really change um, the effectiveness of our school boards in maintaining the quality of our schools. And, and can I give a little history? We're assuming you guys even know what we're talking about. Um, in Topeka, they're considering, well, their effort is to increase local election turnout, which is abysmal. We are not rare. It's nationwide. It's very low. So they've come up with bills that would hopefully increase voter turnout. The problem is there's no data to substantiate that, the, that these efforts would yield the results intended. And yes, we would love to have increased voter turnout. We're saying the opportunity risk here is great enough that we are making a statement or going to vote on it tonight um, as a resolution as a board that not only do we um, not support making changes based on no data and puts these things that Mr. Shearer brought up um, into play, but we vehemently <laughs> want them to listen. So a resolution is not like, no, but no, you know, and so that's our effort here. And if you disagree with us, we, you know, the whole thing is this is a democracy. It's a great venue to um, talk with the folks in Topeka. This is our reasoning of why we don't support that if we vote for it tonight. Right. Thank you. Great. Thank you all. Um, as everybody stated already, the purpose of this really is for the board to come um, and we'll vote to it and, and hopefully send a statement to the legislators and, and let them know, you know what our feelings and what our desires are going forward. Um, but I'll read through this fairly quickly. You know, a resolution by the Board of Education of the Olathe Public Schools Unified School District number 233, Johnson County, Kansas, regarding the Kansas State Legislator's proposed bill to alter the process for electing public Board of Education members in Kansas. Whereas the Founding Fathers of the State of Kansas provided in Article 6, 6 of the state's Constitution for the establishment and maintenance of public schools, and whereas the people of Kansas approved by popular vote an amendment in 1966 endowing locally elected Board of Education with the sole responsibility of maintaining, developing, and operating local public schools, and whereas all children in Kansas deserve access to a public education absent from potential, potential divisive partisanship 
and whereas moving local public school board elections to November of even number years would reduce focus on school board candidates as they compete for attention with all other candidates for every federal, state, and local office, and whereas moving school board elections from the spring to the fall would impair a school district's efficient operation based on fiscal year of July 1 to June 30th, and whereas moving school board elections from the spring to the fall would potentially create a lame duck board, thereby, thereby impeding discussions of administrations, evaluations, contract, contract extensions, teacher evaluation, teacher negotiations, and bu budget preparation, and whereas the current election cycle for electing local public education board members has and will continue to serve the children of Kansas well. Now, therefore, be it resolved that we as a locally elected Board of Education call upon the Kansas State Legislature to pass no law changing the election cycle for local Board of Education and furthermore, may be resolved that we as a locally elected Board of Education call upon the state Kansas legislator to pass no law changing the nonpartisan non status of local Board of elect Education elections. Now, if we do vote this through, it would be adopted by the Olathe School Board District Board of Education on this date, three of the month, April of this year, 2014. So with that in mind, Mr. President, I would like to, where is the, to adopt the resolution that calls upon the Kansas State Legislature to pass no law changing the election cycle for local Board of Education and to pass no law changing the nonpartisan status of local Board of Education elections. Second. I have a motion by Mr. Shear and a second by Ms. Felter regarding the board resolution regarding the timing of school board elections in Kansas. Ms. Hint? Mr. Parker? Yes. Mr. McCune? Yes. Mrs. Martin? Yes. Mrs. Felter? Yes. <laughs> Dr. Daniels? I proudly vote yes. <laughs> Mr. Shear? Yes. <clears throat> Many thanks to everyone's efforts in, in Topeka. I'm I'm very proud of you all. <laughs> all right. Thanks, Lietta. And also Amy for your work and Rick. Thanks. Let us take our comfort break and return back to our chairs at 7 a.m. 7 p.m. <laughs> Let's not do that. <laughs> Thank you. We will can reconvene at this time, and it's not 7 a.m. I believe it'll be 7 p.m. <laughs> um, this is the best part of the evening, our recognition and awards. Thank you very much. Ms. I don't Cole. know about you, but I do love it when I see a packed house. I know. It's awesome. It's recognition time. So thank you and welcome all of our distinguished guests. Before we begin our awards tonight, I'd like to take a moment to recognize a group that's in attendance. Um, in the audience today, we have participants in the 2013-14 Olathe Public Schools Administrative Development Series. They are individuals who are seeking professional, professional development and who aspire to be building administrators. They are chosen, um, recommended to human resources by their building administrators, and attend monthly after-school sessions facilitated by Kathy Donovan in Human Resources and a team of building administrators. Session topics pertain to a variety of building administrator responsibilities and are interactive and involve participants in discussion, role play, and problem solving real scenarios. I'd like to ask this group to stand and please join me in recognizing and congratulating some of our 2013-14 participants. We're going to begin our formal recognition tonight with a community partner. I'd like to ask Heather Schoonover from Community Development to come forward to help with this recognition. We are proud to recognize the Olathe Evening Lions Club for their dedicated support to students and programs throughout the district. The Olathe Evening Lions Club recently took their commitment to the students of the Olathe Public Schools to the high level. 
The local club, chartered in 1947, has served our community through many projects and events. This past March, they worked with a regional grant to provide Washington and Central Elementary schools with a book for primary students. Each kindergarten, first, and second grade student was given a book of their very own to keep and enjoy during the spring break week. Principals at the Title I schools shared that this showed true community support for their reading outcome goals. The Lions Club members have been a mainstay of support for the district's health services team. For many years, they've been best known for providing glasses and eye exams for those who could not afford them. Hundreds of students are able to see better in the classroom due to the Olathe Lions Club dedication to our district. Currently, the club is in final stages of selection of providing high school students from our four high schools and the Olathe Advanced Technical Center with scholarships. They have annual support to high school seniors to help pay for their books and tuition. It is our honor to express sincere appreciation for financial and volunteer dedication to the Olathe Public Schools. I'd like to ask the following Olathe Evening Lions Club members to come forward and be recognized. Nancy Ellis, Dean Walston, v Vivian DeClement, and John Burns, as well as Neil and Beverly Nichols from Lions International. And I'd also like to ask the following district staff to come forward to help thank our Lions Club members. Kathy Musgrave from the Advanced Technical Center, Christy Gottschalk from Washington Elementary, Stephanie Dansko from Central Elementary. <laughs> Thank you for all that you do. Next, we will recognize a student from Pioneer Trail Middle School. Would Liberty Wheatley please come forward along with Principal Mike Walgast and District Language Arts and Title I Coordinator Mary Jo Fox. Liberty, an eighth grader, was named a national finalist for the... Oh. <laughs> Um, she was named a national finalist for the Student Read 180 All-Star Award. The award recognizing the outstanding achievements of Read 180 students who have overcome reading challenges to succeed in school. Liberty started in Read 180 with some reading challenges, but through her hard work and persistence, she is now reading above grade level and is on the honor roll. Her teachers attribute her success to her positive attitude and determination, saying that Liberty will attack a book or assignment and see it through to the end no matter how long it might take or how challenging it may be. Congratulations, Liberty. Bravo. And I know your family is here tonight. We'd also love for them to stand and be recognized as well. Or wave. <laughs> Congratulations. Next, we'd like to ask Liz Bogdan from Pioneer Trail to come forward. And her principal, Mike Walgast, and District Language Arts and Title I Coordinator, Mary Jo Fox, are already up here. Liz is a teacher at Pioneer Trail Middle School and has received the District Read 180 Teacher of the Year Award. Her assistant principal, J.J. Leibel, shared that Liz has made a positive impact not only on her Read 180 students, but the entire learning community at Pioneer Trail. He says her greatest strength as a teacher is the investment she makes in every one of her students. She has the ability to extend striving readers beyond their own expectations. Liz does this through perseverance and a positive attitude. She truly represents the best of our profession. Congratulations. Thank you. I know. Next, we would like to recognize one of our district nominees for state teaching awards. A selection committee with the Olathe Public Schools has announced its nominees for the Kansas Teacher of the Year Award at the elementary and secondary level. Would Gayla Posh please come forward, along with Principal Linda Armstrong. 
Gayla is a fourth grade teacher from Tomahawk Elementary and was named the district nominee for elementary for the Kansas Teacher of the Year program. <laughs> this program is sponsored by the State Department of Education and identifies and recognizes excellent teachers at elementary and secondary levels. Congratulations and best of luck as you move forward in the process. Thank you. And next, I'd like to ask the Olathe North girls bowling team to come forward along with their coach, Jim Anderson, and Principal Dave Morford. The Olathe North girls won the Kansas Class 6A state championship. The team won the team title over second place Topeka Washburn Rural by 111 pins. The state title is calculated by the scores of the top four bowlers over a three game series. And I just found out tonight that they are the first girls team to win the state bowling championship from the Sunflower League. So a very extra special. Woo Good job girls. <laughs> Congratulations. And are your families here tonight? If so, we'd love for them to stand and wave and be recognized as well. Congratulations. Thank you. And finally tonight, I'd like to ask the Olathe Northwest Ravens dance team to come forward along with head coach Shannon Judge, assistant coach Lauren Hip, and assistant principal Greg Smith. The Ravens dance team earned high honors at the National Dance Alliance National and International High School Dance Competition in early March. They were named national champions in the large class varsity team performance category at the National Dance Alliance. During the preliminary competition, the team placed first in team performance and fifth in their jazz routine. Both scores helped advance them to the finals where they won third in jazz and won the national title for team performance. Congratulations. Congratulations, and I know your families are here tonight as well, so we'd love for them to stand and be recognized. Yes, they totally know. Mm -hmm. And that concludes our recognitions tonight. Didn't I tell you that was the best part of the board meeting? Yeah. All right. <laughs> And for all of those of you who came for recognitions and awards, we'd love to have you stay for the rest of our 10-hour meeting here. But, <laughs> but, but feel free to leave if you would like to. We'll miss you, but come back anytime. <laughs> You're good. I could have down and done the splits right there at the end, but I didn't want to be probably, show off. I'm going to show you in the front, <laughs> in that white shirt with all their black jackets. <laughs> You know how I stole that from you. No, I kind of like the dark ones. I know you do. Um, so I dig it. There's a noise group. Yeah. All right. At each regular meeting of the yeah. yeah, the Board of Education reserves limited time for individuals wishing to address the board. Anybody? We request that individual speakers limit their comments to five minutes. The clerk will monitor the time and notify the speaker when the five-minute time limit has expired. Please direct your comments to the entire board. If a response is appropriate, the president will respond or refer to another individual. In an effort to respect privacy, we ask that speakers refrain from discussing personal complaints involving individuals 
individuals, staff members, or students. Those speaking are advised that public comments are videotape recorded for broadcast on the district's educational access channel and audio tape recorded as a matter of public record. Individuals addressing the board should come to the podium at the front of the room and state your name and address. We didn't have anyone prior, but if there's someone who would like, come on down. Welcome. Thank you. I'm Scott Mays, and I have uh, four children in the school district, three seniors and um, one eighth grader. And I wanted to address the board on the subject of traffic issues in front of a Lake the Northwest High School and to kind of give you an update on that and a little bit of background. Um, the, uh, the background, we've, um, I think, been concerned about this issue for a long time and saw that there was nothing going on or planned to be addressed the issue. The issue came up as part of a Lake the Northwest Raven Parent Organization meeting. Um, everybody on the organization was expressing their concern and that led to, hey, why don't we do a petition? So we started a petition back in February, um, which we presented to um, Olathe City Council on March 4th. And we were, um, I think, pleased and encouraged with the response. We got you know, some positive comments, seemed to have a lot of um, uh, ability, or I don't know if ability is the right word, but um, at least desire to address the issue, recognizing that there's nothing on the plan now. And so we, I think we at least got it on the radar screen. Um, for your information, we did present the petition. We had over 1,200 uh, parents from Olathe Northwest and PRT sign the petition. So a large percentage of the student body parents signed the petition. Um, the um, progress we've made on it has been limited since then. Um, they did commit. Um, I think the main issue why it's never been addressed, what my understanding was, is that um, the city felt like there had never been enough accidents to warrant doing anything, frankly. And there was a large disparity between the number of accidents that were reported by the SOR officer, which was over, over 70 in the last two years, and what the city recognizes the number of accidents in front of ONW. Um, I'm going to be meeting along with several people who are kind of on our steering committee next Wednesday with the city engineer to kind of discuss that and some of the other options. And um, uh, as a group, we did not, and an individual, we're not asking them to do anything specific. We, we, we feel they can do, do the best thing, uh, but just we wanted to be sure it got on the agenda and on the plan and, and um, I think raise awareness that the people that are involved all over there in o &W really feel like it's a very serious issue that's not getting addressed. So my purpose today was to give the board an update. Um, any participation support that the board could give, and I know there's some definite lines between what the board could do and what the city can do, and um, but they were talking about some creative things, and so we would sort of simply ask your support, and I'd like to thank you for your time, and if there's any questions, be happy to address those. Mr. May, I have one question, and that is we need to have your address. I'll start with that okay, one Okay, sure. Okay. Um, 11307 South Lake Crest Drive, and that's 66061. And on behalf of the board, I thank you for your advocacy of the students. And um, we'll, we'll discuss this issue with Dr. Barry, and hopefully we'll have some positive results. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much. Hello, my name is Emily Freeman. I live at 10834 South Belford Street in Olathe, Kansas. Um, and I'm following up on what Scott said. I went to that same city council meeting and um, addressed them with um, some personal experience. So, um, I go to Olathe Northwest, and three years ago I was involved in a car accident after school with another ONW student less than one mile from the school. Fortunately, no one was injured, but both of our cars were totaled, resulting in significant losses for our parents and insurance companies. I live just over a mile from ONW, and I see firsthand every day how congested traffic gets in the areas around school, and I've also seen many accidents in the area, too. Much of the traffic consists of young, relatively inexperienced drivers like myself who attend ONW, but there are also many parents taking their children to and from the three schools in this area, and also many students who walk or ride bikes. 
All these people combined and with only one traffic light and a lack of turning lanes, accidents are inevitable. Each day leaving the parking lot takes my friends and me a minimum of 15 minutes and has taken upwards of 25 in the past. I've not once heard a student talk about how easy it is for them to get out of the school parking lot each day, and many people have jobs or other commitments that they must rush to, which adds to the inconvenience and, more importantly, to the safety concern. Much of the holdup comes from the fact that turning out of the school parking lot at any of the exits, whether on College or Lone Elm, is so difficult due to the constant flow of traffic of, sorry, of cars driving by. I cringe at many of the close calls I've seen and also see many drivers who wait and wait for the right time to pull out. Since I began driving to and from school, I've noticed traffic getting increasingly worse in this area. I will graduate in May, but I have a sister who is a freshman at ONW and who will be driving to school beginning next year. On behalf of my sister and other ONW, PRT, and Meadow Lane students and parents, I encourage the not city council, the Board of Education, to um, consider the traffic issues in this area. And Molly, thank, thank you. you very much. We appreciate your responsibility. Thank you. Well done. Thank you. <clears throat> Dr. Barry, do you have any comments on that issue or perhaps something we can address at a later board meeting? It definitely is something we can follow up with. You'll remember that when we had our last joint meeting, it was right about the time they were getting ready to present the petition, and the mayor at least mentioned it that night. Uh, and it's definitely on their radar, and we'll make sure we follow up and be a, a player and a partner in that. Thank you very much. All right. I believe we are at item 6.02, which is the addition of Bank of America to the approved investment institutions for fiscal year 2014. If there are questions or comments, or otherwise I would accept a motion. Mm -hmm. Did I miss something? Was that not included in the original? We I'm lost. I'm on 7.02. 7. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Six. That was one of those 4,000 ones. Yes, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you. We should be 7.03. 7.03, which is the approval of the student trip. Page 7. And, and 7.04. You want to do them both together? That'd be great. Sure. Oh, okay. 7.03, which is the approval of the student, student trip DECA to uh, for Olathe South and Olathe North to Atlanta, Georgia, and approval of the student trip, the SMART team at Olathe North to San Diego. I'm going to San Diego with that. Mm -hmm. Is that a motion? Second. I'm not, I'm not making a motion. Okay. Yeah. I'll make I'm, a motion to approve right. student trip uh, 7.03 to Atlanta, Georgia, and 7.04 to approve the uh, student trip as presented to San Diego. Second. All right. Now that I'm on the right number, I have a motion by Mr. McCune and a second by Mr. Shear for approval of student trips, including Dr. Daniels to go to San Diego. I got that down there. <laughs> Is him. Mr. McCune? Yes. Mrs. Martin? Yes. Mrs. Felter? Yes. Dr. Daniels? Yes. Mrs. Mr. Shear? Yes. Mr. Parker? Yes. Kind of All right. Thank you for correcting me. I appreciate that. Okay, we are at future action items. There are seven of them. This is our opportunity to ask questions about any of those that you might have or any discussion. Uh, uh, Dr. Daniels, I'd, the land lease for uh, Verizon Wireless, can, is, uh, I'm assuming is that for a tower or is that, what is the purpose of that? Uh, Verizon has approached the district. Uh, they would like to relocate a cell tower in the area to um, uh, the site at Mission Trail. Ident they're wor working through the process of identifying specifically where on the site, but obviously uh, away from the building. More of a, a large flagpole uh, looking uh, cell tower, and uh, in exchange, uh, we would receive a, a rental payment over the 10 year period. Is there, and, and, and this is just my lack of education on that, is there, is there any concerns from a technology standpoint interfering with anything that we do in the school? Is there any concerns with having technology tower for our students themselves from a safety standpoint? No. Um, have uh, you done any of that research? Uh, there, that's a great question, but uh, there really, a lot, a lot of studies have been done. Um, what, cell towers, uh, I remember when I started my career 20 years ago, there was a lot more concern about whether or not there were dangers. The studies have shown there, there is not, uh, doesn't present any danger. Uh, I can't speak to the technological. I'm getting a head shake that says it will not run any interference on any of our networks either. Okay. 
Mr. Hutchison, does, does this need to go through city planning? Uh, I I do not know the answer to that. I uh, we can check with Mr. Lillis, though, and, and make sure that um, uh, Verizon goes to the proper channels once it's filed. Okay. We obviously have to file the, um, the, the lease uh, 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 with the county. And would it be possible to get a drawing or a photo or something to give us an idea of what it would look like? Certainly. In, in, in the action item, uh, I know you just have the draft of the lease, but as we bring it forward as an action, we'll have identify specifically where it will be located, legal description and pictures of what it looks like. Thank you. Other questions for Mr. Hutchison? Be thinking about wanting to self-nominate or nominate one of your colleagues for the KASB nominating and legislative committee appointments that will be coming up. The technology plan. Comments, thoughts? I've been reading through it. That's a lot of work, Rita. You've done a great job. So. Thank you. I, I am not going to take credit for that. Connie Smith has done a tremendous job on this technology plan. So really, we, we owe that credit to her. So if thank you have you any Connie. questions on it, I'm going to bring her up. <laughs> well, thank you. Is there a change between this and the lovely notebook? Yes. The, the, the notebook that you have is really the final draft. We cannot submit it to the State Department until you approve it in May. So uh, you'll have a chance to uh, get some good uh, nighttime reading over the next month if you'd like to read it all, and hopefully it will get approved in May. Then we will submit it to the State Department for approval by them. It, in the past, uh, we submitted it to them, and they approved the draft. Then you approved it, and then we made the final submission. They've changed that a little bit. You have to approve it before we can even submit. Thank you. And thank you, Connie. Looks great. Is, is there an intent to get a presentation with it or is it they will just looking for questions from us? There's a lot of material there. <clears throat> There is a lot of material in there. You, you, you have seen quite a bit of that with the TAPS presentation that was made earlier in the year. I can't remember what month that was, but um, because a lot of this is really around technology integration in the classroom. Years and years back, it was more directed towards infrastructure and hardware. We're kind of past that with the State Department. They're really more interested in how technology is being used in the classroom and integration. Um, so you've seen some of that with the TAPS um, initiatives. We will be coming back with more TAPS. Uh, presentations and information um, in the future, but it, if it's your desire to have a formal presentation on this technology plan, we can do that. R remind me, what is TAPS? Technology Action Plan. Those were the, um, you'll, you'll see a lot in there. Th that was the initiative that Connie is actually heading up and directing that uh, to get our teachers and our staff involved in what are we going to spend the $10 million worth of technology money on for student devices in the classroom? What does that look like? What am I going to do with them once I have them in the classroom? Those pilots are proof of concepts are going on right now. We're getting some wonderful feedback from them and that will help us make a decision on what devices we're going to put out into the classrooms, more devices we're going to put out in the classrooms. So of the $10 million from the, the bond, majority of that is addressed in here, what the intent is for there is There was $25 million in the bond, if you remember, for, for technology. Of that $25 million, $10 million was specifically for increasing access in the classroom. Okay. And, and that's, that's a lot of what you see in the, in the TAPS initiatives. Okay. Thank you. And just to reiterate, this is required by the state of Kansas in order to file for E-rate funding, which is a federal reimbursement that we get. So this is required uh, for us to keep this on file and keep it current. <coughs> it's not required annually. It's required for the bond, right? Is no, that correct? It, no, is it, is, it is a... Uh, it's actually a federal requirement that in order to receive those federal E-rate reimbursement dollars, you have to have a technology plan on file with your State Department of Education. Every state in the, in the United States is, is similar. The state of Kansas has decided that those will be three-year plans. 
So what you're looking at is the renewal of the plan from 2011. So there's some information. You'll see a lot of, of the information that was in there in 2011, uh, where, we've, where we've come with the plan that we had then, what's, what uh, actions and success have we had. Um, and, and so this is now filing for the next three years. Okay, thank you. Since we are going to approve this next month, correct? Correct. Correct. All right. Um, then I would encourage board members to get through the document relatively quickly and forward questions. And depending on the number of questions you get, perhaps that would then dictate whether we do a quick overview again right. in May. Does that seem reasonable? Yes. Okay. All righty. Any questions about other future action items? We have um, our written information, the Head Start monthly director's report. We also have the information regarding data on the spring parent-teacher conferences. Any comments or questions about those? And we are at topics of discussion. Board members, ha I have not heard from anyone, but if there are any topics you would like to discuss, now's the time. The only topic that I was going to bring up, um, Scott brought it up. Um, I was actually just at a um, site council meeting and they uh, ask a lot about um, the traffic in front of Lake the Northwest and some concerns. And so I had committed to them that I would bring that up in the board. And then he mentioned he didn't know if he was going to make it here or not. So I'm just kind of following up on my commitment that I said that I would at least bring it up and discuss it. But I, I'm glad that they were able to show up and, and especially the young lady to be able to express her own concern um, of what she's doing with this. As they both mentioned, and we talked about that in the site council, obviously that's, that, that's a city the city has the responsibility for it, but it is an opportunity for us to talk about it because it is affecting our students and, and our faculty and our parents and things such as that. I know, Dr. Berry, we had the um, the uh, joint session and we did talk about some of that. Um, is, is there a, is there anything more that we can do as a board to be able to encourage the city, especially you know, if we recognize that there's some things that we'd really like them to make some changes to? Again, we have a good relationship, in my opinion, with the city. Uh, they're very much on top of it. It just needs to work through their process, uh, but their engineers are involved. But, but again, we have a number of staff members who are in contact with the city and will work through that, whether that be Laverne from a traffic and safety uh, or, or several staff members, uh, Dr. Dugan or others. Uh, but we definitely will be a part of that process and can encourage as much as we can and, and be open to ideas. Uh, again, from a school side, I think the principal does a, a tremendous job everything that she can on our side to to help things uh, very efficient that way but yes we, we will monitor it and encourage it along as best we can Great. is that high school entrance and exit any different in the number of fender benders and or accidents than at our other high schools I don't believe so um, but we can certainly get those numbers but I don't believe so okay okay and Other, as you know, uh, hundred, you look at Olathe South, we have another similar situation with a middle school sitting right next to it, a lot of traffic there. It's a, a challenge for us at a number of places. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Bye. Other topics? You're on, Dr. Berry. Okay. Um, I want to make comments about several things, and some will be more brief than what I'd hoped because not as much to update on where we sit tonight. The first thing uh, from a, a personal standpoint in terms of board members, but some people in the audience may not know that our board president, I believe, has doubled her grandchild count. <laughs> um, that is a truism, yes. As, as of this morning, right? Or yesterday. Yesterday. Last. Yesterday. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Um, you have read in the paper or seen on the news about the, the uh, state of Kansas and our testing efforts right now. Uh, we are in testing season and with a district of almost 30,000 kids, the number of kids that we test in that group are, are extremely high that way. Um, we've always had great protocols in place and we do a good job with that testing aspect. But the state, the CETE, the, the consortium that uh, has devised the tests and actually operate the, the uh, software and, and uh, so forth, um, it's new that this year and so as we have geared up much like we did in 2003 there have been some hiccups well the, the biggest hiccup came uh, this week when uh, and I'm gonna have to look here uh, it was a distributed denial of service 
uh, it was a, a happening in terms of the uh, testing engine that an attack was made to try and bombard the system so that it would shut down. And again, it's very important to know that uh, at no time did we ever have any student data, and it's not even controlled by us, but by the University of Kansas, no data was ever at risk in terms of being breached. And so um, very positive from that standpoint, but the state of Kansas asked all school districts in Kansas to step back um, and, and let them get that corrected for about a day and a half. They actually did come back quicker than that, and they asked some districts to pilot that, and uh, Mary Matthew got a call, and in Olathe we did pilot some testing uh, to get them back online to know that it would work but today we had a full testing day and we had uh, I loved it when Mary sent me the uh, email today over 14,000 assessments were completed in Olathe today so we again we are back on track and headed toward completing those assessments the state of Kansas has extended that window uh, into May and in terms of schools uh, needing a little bit more time to maybe finish that so we're back on track no information was lost uh, and again I give a lot of credit to our principals and our staff for trying to be flexible and, and hang with it uh, because at times it's a little frustrating frustrating to start a test, have the system <coughs> shut down, and, and uh, have to go to plan B, but we're doing the best we can. I had a question, Dr. Berry. Um, the, they're they're in, the, in the news there, and I've received a couple emails, people being concerned about the new testing protocol and, and student data privacy. But if you would please clarify, does this new test require any personal student data that wasn't required on any of the state assessments that we've been using prior? It does not. Um, and again, there's so much misinformation that's out there. There are some people that are critical of the new tests and the testing system and the data collection and, and cite examples that maybe we are uh, collecting the religious affiliation of parents and all sorts of things that are absolutely not true. Uh, we're not collecting anything like that. The data that we're collecting is no different uh, than it has been in the past. It's strictly related to their performance That's on those correct. measures. Thank you for that clarification. Yeah. Second thing I want to update you on uh, would be the legislative session that is ongoing and as we speak I think they are uh, extended into the evening tonight and that's what I'd hope that that maybe I could give you even more of an update but Honest to goodness, uh, things change so quickly uh, that it's it's hard to go through some components and say, well, this might happen, and here's what we might get or how our budget might be impacted because it changes so quickly. They are in the process right now, headed for uh, adjournment from the regular session by tomorrow night. Uh, they're in the final hours of trying to put something together. So that's where a lot of packages come together and deals are made and so forth. Um, the Kansas Association of School Boards has done a great job for us in terms of comparing the components that are out there. And so again, whether it's business and finance or others, we are tracking those to see how it would impact us. The, the things that they have to do, uh, I guess I think they have to do or else the courts might uh, step in and shut schools down. They have to take care of what the court said and, and provide the state aid on the LOB and the capital outlay. So again, for our district, we would get a little bit of extra money in capital outlay, which cannot be used for operating expenses. That's just for repair and maintenance, uh, equipping our buildings. And then we would get some property relief on our LOB. No additional money, but property relief uh, in terms of uh, the, the mill levy. The other components that they are talking about, though, and again, um, some of it is movement that we haven't seen for a number of years. And so we start to get a little excited that maybe, uh, you know, we'd be able to step take a step in the right direction and, and uh, plug some of the holes that we have in, in a very minor way. But again, until they come through, we don't know what's going to happen. Um, if the capital outlay aid is does come about, it's going to extend that uh, definition just a little bit. Might give us just a little bit of leeway in terms of flexibility with software purchase and so forth. They are also talking on both sides about increasing the local option budget from 31 percent to 33 percent and uh, part of the big discussion is whether or not they would require us to go out for an election that that becomes complicated very quickly number one for each uh, school district in johnson county or at least the th big three ones three big ones uh, about a hundred thousand dollars or more to have that election secondly the timing to try and have this uh, you know we are presenting to you a budget in july and has to be certified to the county treasurer in August uh, that there's a very small window, if, if at all possible, um, 
to have that election. And in fact, we have one ruling from Brian Newby that says it would not be possible to have that election. So they are uh, writing the, the proposals right now, at least the way it sat uh, this afternoon, is that it would not take an election, it would just be by action of the Board of Education. And so again, that would be one way that it could be implemented uh, for this next fall. Transportation aid has gone back and forth. Uh, earlier in the week, we were uh, set to receive a, a deduct of over $400,000. That is general fund money that would impact us. That has since been softened, uh, and our loss might be more like $105,000, I believe. Um, at risk is being changed. Uh, the the dense at risk, uh, meaning you have a high uh, population of at risk kids in a, a singular area, that does not apply to our district, so we don't get hit there, but they are taking away some regular at risk kids, ones that are not pro proficient on the test, which again, we have a little bit of an exception with because if, if any kid is to be considered at risk by a definition, those not doing well on the testing or in the classroom would be ones that we might want to, uh, to have. They are also dropping the, uh, or trying to, and then that brought it back again the virtual waiting uh, for virtual schools. That does not impact us at all, really. Another one that does impact us is the component of new facilities waiting. When you open a new school, you get some additional dollars from the state for the first two years. Uh, they're talking about that going away, which would impact us as well. So again, there's a long list, including some policy items that I, I don't even want to take your time with right now. You've seen some of those. We've talked about some of those. But until we have a bill that comes out of a committee, uh, we don't even have it out of the committee yet to go to a full House or full Senate uh, to be able to be uh, debated and discussed. That's when we will update you quickly and let you know what's going on. I don't know if you have any questions or if you have any comments about legislation, but again, things change quickly. Dr. Berry, have you had a chance to share some of our concerns with our elected officials? We certainly have, and, and again, uh, some have contacted us directly. I got uh, several phone calls today from uh, legislators, uh, several emails from legislators uh, wanting to know something quickly, uh, and we usually get that and get it back to them right away. We had the chance yesterday, the Johnson County delegation asked um, three of the superintendents to come over and speak to them over lunch hour. Um, a special guest came in, the governor uh, came in and joined the group, uh, and so uh, again, we had the chance to tell them this exact list and say, we really like this, we don't care so much for this, uh, and felt like they listened. But again, as they disperse and go about the political uh, workings in the hallways and in their committees, everything changes quickly. But yes, I feel like we've been able to share and uh, where we are. The last piece I want to share with you tonight is to give you a little bit of a peek at Millbrook Elementary School, uh, a little video that the Communications Department put together. It gives you just a little bit of a look at it, uh, but it's uh, much better than running you out there tonight, uh, but, but excited to show you this piece. Thank you. Millbrook is a beautiful school with brand new contemporary colors. The classrooms are larger than most other schools in the Olathe School District. There are plenty of classrooms, so space will not be an issue. We have a lot of tap wall for teachers to be able to put things on the boards. It also gives each, each room a different color and a different feel. When I was a child, I got to go to school in the classroom that had the yellow door. Now we'll be able to have children go to the yellow classroom or the green classroom. Um, they're all unique and individual, but all very exciting and colorful. I think students coming at the very beginning will be surprised by the size of the school. It's a very large school. Most people say it looks more like a middle school or a junior high. I believe that's because of all the space that's available for our students. When you come into the school, you will immediately go to the right, which is the office area. Behind that will also be the new cafeteria and the gym. What's really unique about them is that there is a stage that goes between the two, and we can use that as a flexible space. Um, there's In the cafeteria, there's a great space for us to be able to have programs as for smaller groups. So there's a lot of flexible space and lots of beautiful spaces. 
I'm very excited because the building is so beautiful. I'm going from the oldest building in Olathe to the newest building, which is pretty exciting. I'm also very excited for all the beautiful space that we will have. But more importantly, the building is just a building until the children arrive. That's when the true heart of the school comes. And I'm very excited for that day. For more Focus on Features, visit us online at www.olathaschools.com slash TV. That's great. Beautiful. Plans continue to progress for that. They're going to have some uh, evenings coming up where parents can go out and have uh, parent information meetings. They're going to start to talk about mascot and school colors and all those things that go along with the, uh, the brand new school. So we're getting excited. And we're going to get tours soon? You bet. Excellent. All right. Thank you, Dr. Barry. <clears throat> We are now ready for our executive session. How much time do you need? I could use 20 minutes, please. And how much time do you need? Um, probably 20 minutes. All yeah, right. 20 minutes. All right. So we need 40 minutes. I would entertain a motion. Um, <laughs> hmm? I would take this to 820. Madam President, I move to move. I, I make a motion that the board adjourn to executive session for the purpose of discussing personnel matters of non elected personnel and for the purpose of discussing matters relating to employer employee negotiations, and that the board return to the regular meeting at 8 35 p.m. in this room. The executive session is required in order to protect the privacy interests of individuals to be discussed and to protect the district's right to confidentiality of its negotiating position and the public interest. You, you mean till 835, really? Uh -huh. Okay. Maybe extra five minutes. Second. That would be 825. That would be 825 for an extra five minutes, wouldn't it? Yes. 40 minutes. 40 minutes. If you want to stay for it till 835. 835. Okay. 835. If we get out early, we get out early. All right. Then we don't have to come back. There you go. All right. That's a good idea. Did someone second? I did. All right. <laughs> I have a motion by Mr. Parker and a second by Ms. Felter to adjourn to executive session to return at 835. Ms. Mrs. Felter. Yes. Dr. Daniels. Yes. Mrs. Mr. Shear. Yes. I'm sorry. <laughs> Call me Mrs. Shear again. I've had it three times. <laughs> Mr. Shear. Yes. Mr. Parker. Yes. Mr. McCune. Yes. Mrs. Martin. Yes. <laughs>